So uh, last week we started looking at the boat as the metaphor for the church in Mark's gospel. How the boat is the collection of people following Jesus with him there in their midst, which describes the church. Last week we looked how the boat is filled with those people who follow Jesus' call, even though Jesus doesn't tell them where they're going or what it's going to cost them. But they follow him because they trust him, and that that is the meaning of faith. Even though God leads us on this journey, it does not mean that the, sta- that the sailing is going to be smooth. This morning, I want to look at an instance of this. So we're going to continue in Mark's gospel this time in chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. So I'm reading from the NIV. The story says, That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with them. A furious squall came up, and waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and the waves. Quiet, be still. The wind and the waves died down, and it was completely calm. He asked, or he said to his disciples, Why were you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. Now, the sea can be a scary place. I don't have a lot of experience on boats, and so I get nervous in a canoe when things start to kind of move like this. But I don't imagine that the disciples are landlubbers like me. In fact, four of them at least are professional fishermen. And so they're not bothered by a little bit of rocking of the boat, this isn't one of those things that just kind of causes people butterflies in the stomach. This is a for real, we're all going to die kind of moment. And I think it's actually worse than we understand, because we have to understand a little bit of cultural context about what they might be assuming about the nature of their predicament. You see, water is one of the foundational metaphors that the Old Testament uses to describe God and to describe his work and his judgment. If we look back at the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible opens with these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. So that's Genesis 1-2. to The story assumes that the creation, before it's created, is a void, a, a depth, and sort of a, a deep sea, chaotic, untamed, formless, and that then God breathes life and brings organization to that, those waters. And that is the nature of creation. If we fast forward a little bit to the second day of creation, it says, And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. Now, this sounds a little bit odd to modern ears because... Ancient people had a different understanding of how the world was put together, and God lets his people tell the story. And so this story assumes what scholars call an ancient Near Eastern cosmology. I have a a diagram here that kind of shows the way that they think of the world as put together. So in the beginning is this primordial deep, this sort of an untamed ocean. And out of that space, God raises up this vault, uh, a dome, if you will, or an air pocket, separating the waters above from the waters below, they assumed that there was a sea up above us and that sometimes it sprang leaks and that's what caused the rain and that's why it was blue when there's no clouds in the sky. And so there's this idea that God separates waters below and waters above and on day three of the creation, of course, the ground comes up out of it. And that this dome has the sun and the moon and the stars affixed to it. And so that is God separating the waters 
organizing them and creating a space, water below, water above, space here, in which his people can live, where they can thrive. And so when we fast forward to Exodus, oh sorry, not, well, let's not fast forward that far. Let's first stop in Genesis chapter 7, when the flood finally lets go, uh, chapter 7, verse 11, it says, On that day the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of heaven were opened up. And so the picture of God's judgment in Genesis chapter 7 is basically all this water down here going up, and all this water up here coming down. So God had created a space for his people by organizing the world, and he had unmade that space by bringing those two things back together. So that is an act of divine judgment, as scripture understands it. God unmaking creation. Fast forward again, and we get to the Exodus. And the people of Israel are stuck between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army. And what happens? Moses lifts up his staff, and the wind... And in Hebrew and in Greek, the word wind is the same word we use for spirit. The spirit of God pushes aside the water and separates it, organizing it and creating a safe place for God's people to come through. They go through it, and what happens when the Egyptians try to pass through? Water collapses on water. Creation is undone. The order is unmade into chaos, and God's judgment falls on the Egyptians. If we fast forward a little bit, still, we get to Jonah. And in Jonah, God uses a storm, the unordering of the order of this uh, world, to convince Jonah that maybe he needs to step back into line and go to preach the gospel to the people in Tarshish. So in the disciples' context, When the storms are raging, it's a sign for them of God's judgment. And so they find themselves in this storm, and it's not just concerning because the boat is filling up with water. When they find that they're unable to reach shore, they must come to the conclusion, this is God trying to kill us. We don't know what we've done, but God seems to be capricious. God must be responsible for this. And they don't wake up Jesus to call on him to help him. They wake wake up Jesus because they're astonished that he's going to die, and he's just sleeping there in the stern. They wake him up to accuse him. You don't care about us. And so when Jesus wakes up, he changes the way that they think about all of this stuff. He reframes their their situation, not as an act of God's judgment against them, but but as a... Um, an exorcism of a demonic power at work in their lives. We're meant to read it this way, but it doesn't kind of jump out at us in English. But if we go back into the text, we see there's a couple of words. I had them bracketed in the original slide. Um, And it said, in the original slide, you saw two words. One said rebuked, and it said epitomao, and another one was be quiet, and it says fimao. We've seen these two words together in Mark chapter 1, we didn't preach on this, but if you were reading this gospel from start to finish, you'd have seen these words together before. And it's this story of Jesus casting out a demon. Just then there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do you have with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. In other words, Jesus is using the exact same language to cast out a demon that he is to still the storm. So Jesus is showing us that we shouldn't be thinking of this as God's action against us, but rather as the disciples understanding it's God. What we see here is actually Jesus tipping his hand and showing his disciples that he is, in fact, God. They haven't figured it out by this point. In fact, they haven't even figured out that he's the Messiah, and the two of those things aren't the same. They figured that out in chapter 8, but here we are in chapter 4. They just think of him as a rabbi, and there's something special about him, but they haven't quite figured it out yet. But what what did we see God doing in Genesis chapter 1? God, with his words, creates, orders creation and creates a safe space for God's people to thrive. What does Jesus do in this boat? With his words, he reorders creation creating a safe place for his people to thrive. Jesus' actions and words scream out to his disciples, I'm God, but his disciples don't see it. 
They have no mental formula, no box that can contain this idea that God is this person who is here with them. And so they just kind of pick their jaws up off the floor and go, what just happened? Because God's power is shrouded in the common, in the unremarkable nature of a human body. And I would say that God's power is shrouded in our midst in the unremarkability of all of us gathered together. But Jesus' actions also recast a mental image of God's judgment. The chaos of the seas is not God get, uh, trying to, to get even for some slight that the disciples might have done against him. This isn't God's act of judgment against them. This is actually a demonic attack. And while it can be kind of scary to think that there might be dark powers out to get us, it's a whole lot less scary than saying that God is out to get us. We should be encouraged because what this is saying is that when those demonic forces are out to get us, God is with us and he is on our side. And so the chaos and the hardship in our lives is not a sign that God is somehow judging us, that he is displeased with us, or that he is distant or uninterested in what happens in our lives. It is often a sign that there's something deeper going on, something evil, but something over which God is ultimately able to be in control. So the question is, does God bring about hardship on his disobedient children when they step out of line, or maybe it's something different than that. Maybe humans themselves, in their selfish choices, remove themselves from God's place of blessing. Think about it this way. When God creates this space for the Israelites to walk through in the Red Sea, does God say, I've given you this space, walk through on this space, but if you veer off, I'm going to get you. Or is it simply a matter of, this is the space that I've opened up for you. You can go on this. But what happens if a person decides they don't want to walk along the path and they walk into this wall of water? They're swept away. Not because God is actively working against them, but because God has created a place in which they can find blessing. And when they step off of that path, they've stepped out from underneath the umbrella, or the covering of his blessing, and they find themselves being swept up in the torrent of chaos and evil that is constantly trying to destroy us, but God is protecting us. And so God isn't actively seeking to say, obey me and things will go well, and, but if you disobey me, I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit you, or I'm going to smite you. He's just saying, I've laid out these laws so that it can go well with you. I've given, shown you how you can live because this is the blessed way that you can live. If you walk out in there in your own I'm not going to come after you, but it's your choice. You're the one choosing to step out into the place outside of my blessing and outside of my protection. God's desire is never to punish his children for being disobedient. His desire is to steer them away from the place where they will encounter the demonic influence that's trying to destroy them. His desire is to preserve, not to punish. I find it a lot easier to worship God knowing that he, he's not conditionally loving me as long as I'm obedient, that he loves me all the time. And that the reason he's put these, these boundaries in place isn't to keep me in line per se, not to make sure that I obey so he feels like he's in power, but so that we, I can be blessed and that I know where his blessing is and that I can walk in it. So, okay, Jesus rebukes the disciples. Why does Jesus rebuke the disciples? If it were me, I would be rebuking the disciples because I just am so cranky coming up when I wake up after a nap. Carolyn didn't know that when she married me, but the first time she ever saw me uh, after I had had a nap, she, she never let me have a nap <laughs> ever since because she knows I'm such a grouch when I wake up. But that's not Jesus. So Jesus isn't saying, how dare you sleep or how dare you wake me up? And Jesus isn't saying, well, I'm in the boat with you, so there was never any real danger. How do we know this? Because if there were, Jesus would probably wake up and say, okay, guys, you know what? 
this is fine. You're here with me. Nothing bad is going to happen. We can just ride this out together. Let's hunker down, and we know that God is going to deliver us from this situation. Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, Jesus gets up and rebukes the storm. Because the storm isn't God's doing. The storm is demonic. The storm is not God's intention for them. And so Jesus gets up and takes, or takes mastery over the storm because his people invite him imperfectly into the situation. So Jesus isn't saddened by the fact that they woke him up. Jesus is saddened by the fact that they waited so long to wake him up. They tried to do this on their own. And when it didn't work, they didn't call out to him and say, help. They called out to him to just say, you don't care that we're dying. God doesn't want us to do this on our own, to not bother him. God wants us to call out to him. He has given us, as his image bearers, responsibility in this earth. He's given us a measure of independence, of autonomy, so that we can invite him into the places that that we can invite him to work in the world, to restore the world back to the way that it was supposed to be. And so Jesus is like, guys, when you ran into this storm, the first thing you should have done was to call out. You ever read the Psalms? And the psalmist constantly says, Oh Lord, arise! Wake up, O God! Jesus is sitting on a pillow asleep. Now, that's partly because Jesus is a human as well as being God. And he doesn't need to sleep. But at the same time, it reminds us that we cry out to God. And God sometimes says, I'm waiting. I'm I'm willing to intervene in this situation. But you have to cry out for me. You have to invite me into this situation. And I will gladly come and help. But maybe we believe that we can do this on our own. And maybe when that proves futile, we just believe God doesn't care or that God is distant from us. But God isn't distant from us. He's in our midst. He suffers alongside of us. And he longs for us to call out to him and invite him to work through us and in us. And just as Jesus is bodily present with his his gathered people in this boat, he is present in spirit with us. If you... Our Jesus is, he li- the Spirit lives in your heart by faith. And if we are the collection of God's people, then the Spirit dwells here in our midst as well. And just as God's people collectively called out and God came to the rescue, so God invites us to call out to him, to ask him to reorder this creation distorted by the demonic forces of evil and sin and selfishness, and to restore it back to God's original intent. That's why we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So like the disciples, we find ourselves swept up in chaotic storms. How do we react when that happens? Do we try to fix it in our own strength? and Despair when we can't? Do we call out to God and accuse him? of negligence, of not caring? Or do we call on him to set things right? Now, I'm not saying that every single situation in our lives that is unpleasant, we can simply say, God fix this, and God snaps his fingers and changes it back. But how can I know the difference between the kind of situation that God will intervene in and stop versus the kind of situation that he, he wants me to ride through unless I ask? <laughs> God delivers, sometimes by calming the storm, and sometimes by calming us in the midst of the storm. And so let's not grow weary in our prayers. But often our prayers are short-sighted. We see our own needs and our own desires and our own priorities, and we often don't see the needs and desires and priorities of other people as powerfully. There's a movie that came out, it's almost 20 years old, called Bruce Almighty. And it was a Jim Carrey comedy. But in that story, there's this egotistical news anchor named Bruce. And he has like a couple of really bad days at work. And he accuses God of 
being like a petulant child and treating him like, you know, he's got a magnifying glass and he's an ant. And suddenly God shows up. God's not angry. God's actually quite patient with Bruce and says, hey, why don't you try being God? You can have my powers here. I'm going to, you know, stand back and let you do it. And Bruce goes out and heals the sick and cleanses the lepers. And no, he doesn't do any of that. He, uh, he gets revenge on a co-worker at work. And he uh, gets a new wardrobe and a sports car and basically just looks after himself. And then God comes in to check up on him. And Bruce has been hearing all these voices in his head. And he's like, what is this? And God's like, oh, those are the prayers of people. You haven't been working on those? And he's like, well, I've been sort of too busy taking care of some injustices in my own life. Now, I'm not endorsing the theology of a Jim Carrey comedy, but I do think it shows an interesting insight into human nature. That we get very um, aware of the places in our own life where we feel that there's injustices. And we don't always care so much about all the places outside of us. Yeah, we care about our friends and our family. We care about our community. But the further that that circle gets away from us, the the less we tend to care about the problems of other people. And so when we cry out to God, are we simply crying out to God that we can have the things that we need, that we want? Or do we cry out to God and ask that he sets the world right in the places that are close to us and the places that are far away? Now, many of you know that this summer I... uh, I've had um, some health problems. Uh, thank good, you know, praise God, they, are, they seem to have basically been resolved by now, but I had a, a nerve pinched in my neck and it was causing me a lot of pain all the way through my arm. Nothing wrong with praying to God that, to heal me, but at the same time, maybe I spend a lot more time praying about my arm than I pre- spent praying about the people in Afghanistan who are um, now being oppressed by a new government and where terrible things were happening. But in the general scheme of things, I think what's going on over there is a much bigger deal than what was happening with my neck and my arm. And so, yes, we should bring our prayers and petitions to God, but let's not simply stop at praying for the things that are dear and near and dear to us. But remember that when we pray that God's will be done on, he- on earth as it is in heaven, that we need to be aware that there are things happening and that our desire is to see God's kingdom come in this place for all people. So like the disciples, we're God's people with him in our midst, crying out against the the influence of evil in our world, at least if we're doing our job. And he is here among us, waiting for our invitation to change this world. Sometimes he uses miracles. Sometimes he uses us. But he's not distant. He's not uninterested. And so like the psalmist and Jesus' disciples in this story, let's rouse him to action. Call on him to change the world. But unlike the disciples, let's have faith that God is willing and able to do that. So let's not become discouraged in prayer. He's with us and wants to be invited into action. He wants to work through us to restore the glory of this broken world. God is for us. Who can be against us?